production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. This time on Broad and High, we meet an artist who describes his work as a paradox between intentionality and accident. Nature has a pattern, but the thing of it is that sometimes those patterns overlap and then it creates something that looks like chaos. In Oklahoma City, a call for original artwork results in an installation of 4,000 square feet of etched glass. And we visit with an artist whose creations are outrageous and tasty. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Ed Valentine heads the art department at The Ohio State University's Lima campus. His recent series of landscape paintings incorporate lace-like patterns, stenciled birds, and splotches of brightly colored graffiti-like spray paint to give each work a man-made nature feel. We recently stopped by Ed's studio to learn more about his project. I grew up in what is now known as Franklinton, but it, when, when I was a kid, it was the Bottoms. My twin brother and I and our best friend would just leave in the mornings and sometimes we'd end up on the railroad track. I started probably in about 1989, putting birds in a lot of things. I think maybe because I just hungered for some sort of nature. We lived on Bowery in New York. We had a fire escape that was probably, oh, 15 by five feet. I had tomato plants, I had basil, I had oregano, and I had morning glories and it would attract birds. And it reminded me of how much I missed nature growing up in the bottoms, hanging out on the railroad tracks. It was all about nature. So the birds just sort of found their place in, I guess, my subconscious. My mother-in-law lives in Bryan, Ohio. And she used to have, for the longest time, about 20 years in Bryan, Ohio, she had this thing where she would get together with a bunch of older women and she, her business was called Nancy's Afternoon Tea. And they would just get together and they would play mahjong and she would make little sandwiches and they would sit around and talk about Victorian stuff and share little bits of lace that they found in thrift shops or antique stores. Well, the inspiration did come from lace. I knew I wanted them to be landscapes, so lace sort of made sense to me because the lace really does sort of uh, invite uh, man's sort of intrusion into nature. The idea of a chalkboard, writing on a chalkboard, is just something that I think everyone can sort of relate to. And then the idea of that sort of basic rock on rock, because that's what we're doing when we're drawing with chalk on a chalkboard. So go to the opposite end of that, and it's definitely spray paint. It's chemicals, it's, it's a, a lot of technology. And then I had to find something in the center, in the middle, so I just thought it would be the drips and the spatters which are sort of accidental. So, in other words, the landscape is built through um, intentionality, which is the, the lace, and then a little bit of planning, the way I place the birds. I sort of analyze where I want them, according to design. And then the um, drips and spatters just sort of imply accident. So, you get those three sort of psychological levels, which is why I call them a landscape. Once the lace is drawn, I definitely have to take the thing outside and just layer it with spray fix. So that's done, I can't go back to that. And when I come back in, and this is what I've always told my students too, I say walk in with your back against the painting, 
walk 10, 15 feet away, spin around quickly, and the first thought you have, go with it. So that might be putting a bird someplace, that might be starting with the spatter. The spatter is sort of important to put down, especially the two big white strips, because I don't want it to ever drip over one of the birds. One reason is because the spatter is gesso and that's water-based, and the spray paint is oil-based, so eventually it would just peel off. The other reason is, is I don't want the two to ever overlap because then it kills the idea of three vertical planes. And let me open this, get this out of the way. Nature has a pattern. There is a pattern, there is a rhythm. But the thing of it is is sometimes those patterns sort of overlap and then it creates something that looks like chaos, but it might just be, just might be the intersection of two patterns. I do like the idea, and I do it in my portraits and I do it in the uh, still lives as well, the idea of and it's almost like I'm giving away a secret recipe when I say this, so, but I will say it. The idea of the, the paradox between intentionality and accident. It, it's, it, I mean, it just works. I have this idea that art should be just a little bit over people's head, but not so much over their head that they just look at it and they're confounded. But if you're going to invent a language, which is what we're doing, when I finish one of these paintings, the thing that, all, that always pleases me is I brought something new into the world, something that never existed before. So when you're doing this, you're sort of creating a language. And if you create a language that only you understand, because it's so elevated and it's like so ethereal, what's the point? When somebody's standing in front of that painting, I just want them to accept the fact that it's going to come at them like all at once. And then don't try to figure anything out. It's just, it's there. It's like listening to music or smelling food coming out of a kitchen. I mean, you don't really think that much about it. Most people overthink painting. When just, I just want people to react to them. If you'd like to see Ed Valentine's paintings in person, check out the Land Exhibition at the Columbus College of Art and Design's Beeler Gallery now through February 26th. And to learn more about Ed's artwork, visit edvalentineart.com. Over the past two decades, Oklahoma City artist Matt Goad has helped create the look of the modern cityscape with street signs, logos, and beer cans. Now he's tackling his biggest project, a 40,000 square foot terrazzo flooring at the Will Rogers World Airport expansion. The goal is to tell city history and inspire visitors to see the city as a modern metropolis bounding with possibility. Let's take a look. I'm Matt Goad. I am an Oklahoma City resident since about the year 1990-ish. And uh, I do visual stuff like art and graphics. Yeah, people ask me what my style is, and I guess it's an amalgamation of all the things that I've always loved. You know, you, you become a fan of a bunch of stuff, and then it all kind of gets mixed together, and it becomes who you are. At least that's the way it is for me. I worked at, a, at an ad agency for a few years in the 90s and that allowed me to get some of the graphics I did out in the public where people saw them. Did the E for Edmund with the tree, Oklahoma Keep Our Land Grand going into the trash, the um, Film Row logo I've done, the, the Midtown Vets downtown, uh, Elk Valley Brewery. 
Well, Eve is my little girl. She's a 1964 uh, Volkswagen Type 1. I think Eve, in a way, unintentionally has become part of my trademark. I always love uh, photographing her in front of uh, a lot of the cool mid-century structures around Oklahoma. I love the Egg Church for so many reasons. It's so dynamic the way it looks, and when you see it poking up over the trees, you feel like you're in a Star Wars movie or something. I think we got a really good shot of kind of um, seeing that curve of the beetle with the curve of the church. I've never been a good photographer as far as, you know, the f-stops and all that, but I'm pretty good with the iPhone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Oklahoma City. The local time is 10.07 a.m. Central Time. Please keep your seatbelts fastened until we are parked at the gate. It is such a wonderful addition to our airport, encompassing 134,000 square feet of new space and many new amenities, including a new checkpoint, new airline gates, new concession spaces, and wonderful new art. I'm so excited for you and all the people of Oklahoma City to see this new front door to our great city. In 2019, they had a, a call for in entries for artists to submit for a 40,000 square foot floor. You know, I assumed, of course, there's no way I could even become a finalist, but it was worth, it was worth a shot. Frankly, Matt made the decision fairly easy. I've done a number of art selection committees and Matt's was by far the most thoughtful presentation that I've ever seen. And I think when people come to the airport and, and see this, they're going to be wild. You know, growing up, wanting to be a professional artist, you never dream that uh, the biggest project of your life is something everybody's going to walk on. <laughs> All I remember as far as my uh, earliest memories is drawing. I was always, always had a pencil. My mother was extremely uh, supportive and she's the one that kept the scrapbook. It, it's like a time machine, you know. You know, this could actually be in MoMA now, I mean. <laughs> I grew up the uh, son of a traveling preacher man. We lived in about a different city every, almost every year. Um, by the time I was 12, I had lived in, I think, eight states and uh, about 11 cities. Uh, I came to go to school at Oklahoma Christian in 19, fall of 1988. We were one of the only schools that had a good graphic design program and I didn't know really what that was at first. It was but they said it's something to do with art and uh, you can get a job in it. So that led to an internship with a, a real design studio and that was when my eyes were opened to this isn't just a job, this is awesome. This is like, you know, this is wow, super cool. I'm a big fan of uh, mid-century modern, if you couldn't tell already. The aesthetic of it is to me just something that's it's, it's a positive. It's like um, looking forward in a positive way to the future and that always makes me happy. So I don't ever really say I, I paint paintings, I say I build paintings because the way I do it's not like a normal painter in the classical sense. It's like an architect draws it out and then you build the house from the drawings. As far as how I do my work, I always, it's always an idea and then it becomes a sketch. All of these are uh, like mental notes to myself. I can do 50 of them and I might like two or so. But once I have one that I like, I cannot stop working on it. Usually I'm like giggling. You know, I'm having fun. <laughs>
And what I do is I'll take that line drawing um, and I will bring it into the computer and make a stencil out of it. Yeah, I'm kind of a Jedi wizard with Illustrator. Still got some tape, I've got it ready and a, and a little bit of stencil. So then what I'll do is put a clear just over those spots. Then I'm gonna prime it. And then once I have that stencil built, that's when the color comes in. For me, color is the hardest part. That's why it's the most fulfilling when I feel like I've accomplished it. I call this checkerboarding, and it's kind of where you don't have a color touching exactly. It's almost like a square dance of colors that happens in my paintings. It's, it's funny how every color has its own little personality, how it, how it behaves. Some are more opaque, some are just beautiful. It's kind of like people. This painting's gonna be intense, like Boy Scouts. That's my joke, get it, intense. <laughs> Matt is the coolest guy I know. <laughs> and he, he doesn't even know how cool he is, and that's why I love it. I think we needed some bigger artists to give the space legitimacy so that we could be a platform for more emerging artists. And I always had the dream of having an original Matt Goad. Really, the only guidance we told him was big. As long as it could fit through the door. I feel like the more you look at this piece, just the more you discover. Like a little nod to the dolly clock in the corner. And the submarine and the infinity couple. It's very Matt Go. <laughs> Let's see how this works. Good. I think I love it. I think I'm in love. Some people in the canyon. A little touch up here and there. My perfectionism is a, a, a compensation for the craziness in my head. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I still um, can't really grasp the reality of the, the, this project for an artist that, you know, wasn't really great at school, was kind of okay at drawing. I don't know, I, I still am pinching myself. Well, I hope that when people come to Oklahoma City and land in that area, they're gonna have an instant positive feeling about the city. To see more of Matt's work, visit mattgoad.com. After graduating from Ohio State, Natalie Sidesurf put her fine art skills to work in the culinary world. She first rose to stardom in 2013 after creating a cake sculpture in the shape of country music star Willie Nelson. Even without tasting them, I think you'll agree her culinary creations are pretty sweet. A lot of people are bakers that then do sculpted cakes, but instead I'm an artist who started doing sculpted cakes. Sugar, flour, eggs, all these materials, they start out as scratch ingredients. It's this really cool process. You turn them into a cake, and then you turn them into a cake sculpture, and then everybody eats it. Having that attitude and that kind of, that art background, you know, I see myself as an artist first and a baker second. Baking is absolutely artistic, so they really go hand in hand. It's really great to do both. Before I start a cake, I gather as many images as possible of, in this case, a T-Rex. So I'm looking up toys and models. I'm looking up, you know, dinosaurs and movies. So I gather all that information and then I come up with my design and how I want the dinosaur to kind of feel. So here we have the unpainted T-Rex. This is all covered in chocolate. There is a cake board that comes right through here, and this back leg actually has that rod that is holding that cake board up. Connected to the cake board is a wire that is going to go through for his tail and then come through to the head. All right. While I was at Ohio State, uh, my concentration was in drawing and painting. So. It's funny because everybody always assumes it was sculpting. Uh, and I did do a lot of sculpting, but I mostly was doing painting. And I'm so happy I did because I think that's really what kind of, I want to say like brings them to life. You have to learn how to use a material. Somebody can't just be like, this is how you do it. It's not that easy. You have to kind of get your hands on it and work with it. And I think that my education at Ohio State was just absolutely necessary and absolutely influences how I work with cake today and why I've had some success, successful moments. <laughs> the idea that cake throughout history has always been a way for people to celebrate. Everybody gathers around, you get a giant group of people together. I think it's so crazy that a cake can represent so much. It represents a birthday or a wedding, and I get to, you know, create these sculptures out of cake so that they can celebrate their moments in their lives. Sometimes when I drop cakes off, you know, people cry. They're just so emotional about what's going on. They're so happy with the design and the cake that they just get they just get a little emotional. The next thing you know, you know, is your son graduating? Oh, they see the cake and they cry, you know? And that is just like something that I never realized, you know, I would impact people in that way. I'm so happy to do it. To see more of Natalie's work, including cool time-lapse videos, visit SideSurfCakes.com. Well, that's our show. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching.
Dina Lawson was born in 1979 and has become a really, you know, influential photographer. This work pictures is 48 images of her, the artist's cousin Jasmine, um, visiting her partner in Mohawk Correctional Facility uh, with their children. Um, but what I think is really sustains this piece is the evident care and love and the sort of bonds of family that persist in this situation. And they are, you know, despite that sort of difficult circumstances, a really kind of beautiful and touching image of a family. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.